All right then, short and nice and easy chapter here about log analysis and seam appliances, because these are really relevant whenever you're preparing yourself to have something to analyze, just have, have something to investigate during incident response. Performing incident analysis and mapping that analysis with one of these attack patterns or uh, attack frameworks is made a lot easier by the presence of a SIEM appliance in your network. So a SIEM tool is a security information and event management tool that collects information from network traffic and from uh, device and application logs in order to be able to generate some smart insights into all that data. We call this correlation that is taking seemingly disparate and completely independent events and trying to make sense into understanding what exactly is happening in there, potentially identifying a security incident. So a SIEM device can be used for log storage, even though it's not exactly designed for log archival because we need the SIEM appliance to be able to quickly respond to correlated events. If you have a huge database of all the logs generated in the past five years, obviously we're not gonna be able to react exactly the same moment when the security incident happens. So we can use the SIEM as a temporary log storage solution, but not as a log archival solution. But we are gonna be using it to analyze those logs. We're gonna use it to uh, learn, to create some patterns. Machine learning is a, is a great feature combined with the abilities of a SIEM because it is able to update and continuously monitor the baseline that it builds internally for all the monitored environments, all the devices and all the servers that are generating those events that end up in the SIEM. Trend analysis is another very useful feature present in a lot of the SIEMs out there. And it's about looking at patterns, seeing patterns in past data in order to be able to anticipate or to predict how that data will evolve over time. Trend analysis is the main technique involved in building this baseline that the SIEM tries to continuously monitor in order to identify outliers and events that don't match whatever was observed in the past regarding a specific type of application or a protocol or a server or any type of device in your network. For trend analysis, we'll be looking at a number of factors. For example, the frequency of events. Now, a single error or just a couple of errors in a small time frame, it might not warrant any investigation, but an increase in the frequency of, uh, let's say, application errors, DNS errors, routing errors, perhaps even. It might indicate the fact that somebody is trying to tamper with your network. Volume analysis could be looking at how much of something you are currently using, how many logs are being generated, how much storage is being used, how many disk input and output operations are we seeing, right? How much CPU is being used at a specific point in time. If monitoring these show us that we are looking at an increasing trend, that trend might indicate an alert saying that if you keep doing this, if this, uh, this trend keeps going in one week or so, you will end up with no resources and your, your infrastructure will become unusable. And finally, trend analysis helps us identify those outliers, those points that don't match the baseline, that present statistical deviations from the baseline. It could be about specific events, it could be about resource usage, uh, network traffic usage, and so on. Logs are generated by pretty much anything on your network. Devices, workstations, servers, operating systems, applications. And those generated by operating systems are somewhat of a special category because they can be in a number of formats. It might be difficult to unify them into a, a single environment to normalize them inside of a SIEM appliance. And they also belong to multiple categories. For example, on Windows systems, Windows operating systems, we're gonna find a couple of categories uh, in which the logs are being generated by default. We have application logs generated by the actual applications on the systems and by system services. This is where you'll find alerts regarding a service that cannot start, for example. We also have security logs. These are considered to be audit events, as in we're checking to see if something still complies with our security policy. A failed login, for example, or a, an attempt to execute something that a user doesn't have enough privileges to execute. That's gonna be shown here in the security log. Uh, system logs are gonna be generated by the operating system and the service regarding the functionality of the operating system itself. 
So uh, not having access to the network, not having access to storage, not being able to perform some sort of an operation that is required by the operating system, these errors are going to be found here in the system log. Setup logs are being generated by the installation of programs, Windows updates, and basically anything that can change the configuration of the system and its applications. And finally, forwarded logs. These are logs that don't belong to our own host, but have been uh, taken from other hosts. So they have been forwarded to us from other workstations. Now, Windows logs are by tradition binary files. That's why you don't you need a specialized application, event viewer for that matter, in order to be able to read the contents of those logs. On the other hand, also traditionally, on the other hand, in the Linux world, we've grown used to see Linux as the environment that generates logs in text format, which are easily parsed and read by pretty much anyone and anything. Now, funny enough, in recent days, we kind of we are kind of witnessing a paradigm shift here, where Linux logs are slowly becoming binary, especially with more recent distributions, and the binary format of those logs needs to be accessed using a specialized utility called Journal CTL. While at the same time, Windows is slowly moving towards text file logs. So there we go, pigs can fly. Mac OS, with it being a specialized distribution that is based on FreeBSD, so it does have the Unix philosophy at its core, still generates uh, text log files. It does have a specialized utility to access, uh, access them, even though you can gain access to them directly from the command line, just as with any regular text file, and that utility is called the console app. A bit of a bad naming convention, I would say, since whenever we say console, we definitely think about something else other than the utility to access log files, right? <laughs> Among other logging sources that you can find, uh, they're going to be network devices, especially network devices. These are probably the number one source of all the logs that deal with the uh, well-being of your network. So routers, switches, firewalls, load balancers, proxies, anything you have in your network can generate log alerts informing you when something has happened. It's pretty useful to have this type of information, not just for the health of the devices themselves, but also because those devices can alert you about intrusion events or about a failed authentication or about a device that is attempting to perform IP spoofing or Mac spoofing on your network. Logs generated by authentication systems are again very useful. Now we're talking here about AAA servers, we're talking here about Active Directory domain controllers, anything that has to do with managing user identities and allowing or denying access. Obviously you will want to log any kind of failed login attempt, but also you might want to gather as a statistic for statistic purposes, uh, the successful logins as well. Vulnerability scan results generated by the vulnerability scanning software. Well, usually these results are going to be presented as a report that has to be interpreted by the admin. But in some situations where this vulnerability scanning solution is running uh, unattended, for example, every day at night or every number of days, uh, perhaps uh, you know the admin is not going to be looking over each and every report that is generated. That's why it might be useful to have that scanning solution generated generate a log as an alert whenever one of those reports, even though nobody looks at them, happens to, to contain one or more vulnerabilities. Web servers can generate a lot of useful information in their, in their generated logs, not just about errors. Even though errors are really useful as a source of information, you're going to be looking at 400 errors, which are client errors. Uh, you're going to have to analyze any 500 errors that might occur because those indicate a problem with the server itself. But you might also want to find within those logs an indication of a malformed request that happens to hit your web server. Perhaps HTTP headers that don't really play by the HTTP standard or connection attempts that were never finished or any type of input that is coming from your users that has generated some sort of an error or an abnormal response in your web server. Those are all potential indicators of compromise. Not to mention that a web server can also identify who is accessing it. Now, how many users have been accessing a specific resources or what type of browsers uh, were those users using? Or where are they coming from? Are your clients located in a single country or across the ocean or from within the company? 
DNS logs, just like with web server logs, can offer you a lot of information about successful name resolutions. So for example, you could glean from the DNS logs what are the destinations that your users are constantly accessing. You can also get a lot of information from the errors. Why do we get resolution errors? Is it really someone who isn't unable to correctly type a domain name in the, inside of our company? Or is it a faulty malware that is attempting to connect to a non-existing domain, perhaps? A memory dump is another priceless source of information. A memory dump is created on the disk as an image of the memory of that system whenever something goes wrong, whenever the system crashes, whenever an application crashes. And it's really useful to be able to analyze the contents of a memory dump in order to identify what exactly led to that application crash. Was it an attempt to exploit a vulnerability? Was it just a programming error? Was it something that was due to a denial of service attack? You really need to understand what exactly happened in there. Now, a memory dump is not exactly part of the logging sources of information. You cannot exactly implement those memory dumps and inject them into a SIEM appliance, but they will be an important information source whenever you start investigating. Mobile devices don't exactly generate logs by themselves, or at least not logs that end up in your uh, company or your SIEM appliance, but by analyzing those uh, devices, you're going to uncover a whole treasure of historical information, like the call history of that device, or what type of uh, internet destination has it accessed, what type of history does it have in its browser, what type of information does it currently have cached, or even malware that might still reside on it. Now, the actual call history, the actual call records, that is something that you will have to get from the mobile operator, not from the mobile phone itself. Finally, additional sources of information, also called metadata, in other words, data about data, can be gleaned, can be extracted from files on the file system. The last time when a file was accessed or by whom, that's something that might be attached to that file itself, depending on what file system the file is stored on. Metadata about web requests and replies, these might be logged into your actual web servers or within any other intermediary devices, such as your firewalls or IPSs or IDSs. And finally, on email messages. Metadata found in the headers of email messages can provide you with a lot of information about the path that the email message has taken and the servers through which it had to pass and the security checks it was subjected to in order to reach you. And you should know that the main protocol in use nowadays, as it has been for many, many years already, for generating and transmitting logs over the network is called syslog. It's a very old protocol, it's running over UDP port 514, it has absolutely no built-in security, so everything is in clear text, but we don't really expect to send very sensitive information as a syslog, especially since those syslogs should only be present or transmitted within our internal network and perhaps even over a management network. Now, there are newer versions that implement some security into syslog, but of course they're going to be running on different ports like 1468. As for the structure, it has been the same ever since the inception of the syslog protocol. As a structure, we have a header that looks pretty much the same on every syslog message. We have a timestamp that uniquely indicates when that message was generated, which is, means that it's very important to have your time in sync on all your devices that generate syslog. The IP address that was used to generate and to send that syslog message over the network. A facility is some sort of a subsystem that actually generated that syslog. So you might have a an entire UTM device or entire firewall, but you might be interested in only uh, checking those logs generated by the, uh, let's say, the authentication subsystem or the antivirus subsystem or only the intrusion prevention subsystem, okay? The severity of the log is just a numerical identifier that indicates how critical that log is. It might be just a simple debug message, it might be just an informational message, or it might be a message that is saying <laughs> with its last breath that the router has failed. <laughs> That's going to be a critical one. And finally, the message itself, that's the payload of the log message. And unfortunately, there's no, there's no standardized model for describing the contents of a syslog. Basically, every application and every vendor and every device out there can write whatever they want in that message body. More often than not, it's actually just a description of something happening with that description being designed to be read by human eyes. So it actually tells you a story. This and this happened uh, when this was happening as well. So 
Unfortunately, this is also one of the uh, difficulties in normalizing and parsing syslog messages from many vendors. And this is one of the uh, tasks that the Seam appliance is, uh, is required to do. Normalization of all the information in these syslog messages, even if they might be coming from tens and hundreds of vendors and thousands of different uh, applications and operating systems and network appliances. And apart from the header, the facility and the severity, they are all going to look completely different. Finally, the last source of information that can be correlated with syslogs and with any other source of logs on a CM appliance is network traffic information. Now, network traffic can be captured in a number of ways. The first and the most obvious method is to perform a simple packet capture. That is actually capturing all the packets that are traversing over the wire or over wireless and then sending that packet dump to the seam to be analyzed. Now, this is not always feasible. For one reason, you might not have just a single point of traffic collection in your network where all the interesting traffic can be found. So you might have to gather that traffic from a number of different points, which already creates a lot of administrative burden. Secondly, the amount of traffic that you might need to capture could be huge. I mean, you could have gigabit links all over the place, especially between virtual machines and servers in a data center. If you try to capture all that traffic and send it to a seam, you will overwhelm that seam in a matter of minutes. So that is not always feasible. That's why we have additional solutions that instead of capturing the entire packet content, they are only capturing a description or a statistical view of the traffic that has passed through a link or between two uh, destinations. We call these traffic summaries generically, we call them NetFlow. Now, NetFlow in itself is a protocol that was invented by Cisco, but the technology behind it, this uh, summarizing technology of just looking at the traffic and then generating a report of top talkers, how much traffic was transferred, uh, how many connections were, were generated, who were the, uh, the endpoints between those connections, how long did those connections last, and so on. Basically, everything about that traffic, except for the actual traffic content, that technology has been implemented several times by multiple vendors out there. So you're going to find it as S-Flow, you're going to find it as J-Flow, you're going to find it as IP-Fix. And fortunately, even though the original NetFlow was a proprietary protocol from Cisco, the newer ones have become much more open and fortunately also much more capable. So nowadays we even find Cisco equipment that can support uh, IP-Fix, for example, which has become the de facto standard for uh, gathering this type of network statistics uh, as a flow information. So instead of sending the actual packet captures to your seam, you're now sending NetFlow statistics. And those NetFlow statistics can be easily assembled and prepared and sent by the networking devices themselves. So you don't really need any intermediary device to collect that NetFlow data and then send it back to the seam. You can also perform protocol analysis. With or without NetFlow, the SIEM appliance can also perform some sort of protocol analysis. That is, generating statistical information simply by looking at the protocol headers that are generated either by the events and syslog messages or by the events captured from NetFlow traffic or pure package capture. So a SIEM would be able to generate a high-level overview of who is talking to whom in your, in your network, uh, how much traffic they're generating, which applications have been detected over the network, and so on. Finally, monitoring the bandwidth usage is very important because bandwidth spikes and abnormal bandwidth usage can often be an indicator of compromise. Now, monitoring bandwidth can be done in a number of ways. We could even get this information out of NetFlow statistics. So NetFlow could report to us that in a specific time frame that was a huge bandwidth spike between this and that destination. But often bandwidth monitoring is performed using dedicated solutions. We have network performance monitoring solutions out there that are designed to monitor the performance of an entire network at the level of each and every interface. So we have collectors all over the network, we can, might have plugins, or we might even rely on SNMP traps and queries to gather this information directly from within our networking devices. Usually these solutions for monitoring the bandwidth and the health of the networking devices, they are running as standalone software on some server or some virtual machine, and then uh, they constantly query or wait for those devices to report back to them their health. Uh, they are periodically checking them, pinging them 
to see if they're still responding and then they're querying all the SNMP OIDs regarding their resource usage, their bandwidth usage, their interface status, any errors that might have been generated and so on. So it doesn't really matter how you get this information uh, regarding your bandwidth usage. The important part is to have this information injected into the seam so that when a certain event happens in a network, that event could be correlated with a bandwidth usage event. And that might indicate to you in a matter of seconds, perhaps, that a denial of service is happening or that a data exfiltration attempt is currently going on. So I promised you an easy chapter and hopefully I did hold my promise. So I hope you found this informative and useful. I know this wasn't really the most complicated chapter out there, but I hope I managed to present it in an easy to understand and easy to follow way. This should be more than enough for the Security Plus exam. So good luck in your studies. Uh, like, subscribe, comment, support, whatever you want to do. But whatever you do, make sure you don't miss the next episode. Thank you.